Hello and welcome everybody to the How We Heal series. My name is Melanie Olenberg. I'm from the Inner Arts Collective and I'm joined today by three panelists, Miranda, Samit and Jennifer. Um, and today we're gonna to be talking about relationship problems. Now the How We Heal series is really committed to um, some of the topics and issues that we're noticing in our practices uh, so, that, so that we can give folks resources and tools and support that they need to navigate these challenging times while we're in the middle of COVID, um, but also to give folks tools and resources post COVID that they can continue to use moving forward. A lot of the themes that are coming up um, for, for, for folks are, are not um, time specific themes. They're themes that, that come up for people time and time again. And uh, we're just feeling that it's, it creates, um, great value to be able to pull together during these times and um, use COVID as, as, uh, and these challenges as, as teaching tools um, for us all to, to find the resources and the support that we need. So um, to get started, uh, we'll start with uh, just an acknowledgement. If you guys could, could take a moment to feel the land that you're on and appreciate the ancestors of that land we're coming from all over all over the world <laughs> and give thanks to your own ancestors give thanks to all that brought you to this place that you are here today also like to honor future generations because the work that we do today in our relationships and with each other will help foster a future for our children and their children and their children. And I'd like to give gratitude to all of you here today for stepping forward to do this work and to have these deeper conversations and support each other. Thank you. So to open up, um, I'd like to invite uh, Miranda, would you mind introducing yourself, um, the work that you do to give our listeners an idea of who you are? And also in the context of relationship problems, what brought you to this conversation and why, you, um, why you're jazzed up about being here today. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you for bringing us all together. Uh, so, you know, maybe I'll start with the second question, which is what um, really drew me to this topic and to put my name forward as a, a panelist. Uh, all of the people that I have seen uh, in my counseling and therapy work have all been uh, bringing with them relationship issues, whether it's from past or present or the desire for future relationships. So it's just, it's so intertwined with who we are as humans. We are all intertwined in past, present and future potential relationships. So it's, it's very much part of being human. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the things I see um, people I'm working with more recently struggling with or dealing with. Um, but my, um, my own background is um, kind of from the kind of Western uh, training side of things. I'm a social worker by training, uh, have a master's degree in social work. And most of my frontline clinical counseling services were with people uh, dealing with mental health issues uh, and substance abuse issues. I also worked with women and children who had lived with trauma and were covering from trauma, uh, physical violence, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. Uh, and uh, I have a private practice now. So I worked in uh, agencies, publicly funded agencies for many years, but now have a private practice. But I also have um, gone on my own and kind of departed a bit from my social work training by um, uh, becoming a meditation teacher 
and uh, mindfulness meditation teacher, as well as breath work. So I take uh, breathing work from the uh, yoga tradition of India and uh, take in what has kind of come to the Western part of the world from that. Uh, and then most recently, my own development is in just deepening my breathwork practice. So I've been uh, dabbling in some other traditions that are new to me, which um, I'm really benefiting from personally. And when I work with people, I, I really just present, you know, here's kind of what I know, here's where I'm comfortable working and supporting you. And I uh, offer up to my clients um, some choices about which path they want to take. Do they want to do more breathing and mindfulness, um, experiential kind of body, breath, mind work? Uh, do they like more of a talk therapy, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, send you home with some notes to track and journal your thoughts and feelings and actions? Um, so I kind of really tailor what I do to what people are really interested in because we're all different and um, you know, I like to be able to offer people some choices. Yeah, and I see individuals and couples uh, and families, um, more families with teenagers, but uh, families, couples and individuals. Thank you so much. Sumit, would you mind um, introducing yourself and what gets you excited yeah. about this topic? Hi, everyone. My name is Sumit. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I'm a psychotherapist, writer and comedian based in Toronto. I work mostly with millennial and Gen Z men around modern male issues um, with an emphasis on spirituality. Um, so what brings me here is that uh, for most of my life, I struggled with relationships, not just with intimate ones, but just with um, relationships, any kinds of them. Um, uh, and so I was mostly very kind of lonely person, didn't know how to communicate with people, be around people, um because i lived a very kind of sheltered existence my parents always kept me indoors you know which is kind of something that a lot of millennials are struggling with you know um having a, a kind of heavy attachment to technology and the way that uh, that's affecting the way um, we socialize um <clears throat> so yeah for a long time i i just didn't know how to navigate relationships at all um but then when I started to do my psychotherapy program, I was forced to finally confront this because I had to. Um, and what I realized is that, um, cause I used to always think of myself as a strong independent person. I can heal everything on my own, figure everything out on my own, which is kind of something that a lot of, that's a baggage that a lot of men have, you know, being very stoic. I don't need anyone, you know, that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> But the truth is that that humility and surrendering to relationships and the feminine and all that it has to teach the masculine, um, it was the most powerful and intense healing I ever experienced, you know, um, you know, because I, I went from always struggling with tension, conflict, confrontation, intimacy, vulnerability to now um, being quite adept at those things, you know. Um, over years of practice with some tools and concepts that I'd like to share with everyone. Um, yeah, and, and I wouldn't be who I am if I didn't have the courage to enter those relationships and open my heart. And this is something that now that I'm at this point in my journey, I'm now noticing it with other men as well, too, that um, they're having the same struggles that I did, but they don't have the same toolbox that I did to be able to navigate the relationships in this way in a way that is fulfilling and healthy. Um, so that's why I, I want to work with men to kind of, um, so them, so they can be more elevated in their relationships. And, um, and thing is relationships now are more complicated than they ever be. You know, they used to be simple. They used to be very kind of like based on an economic transaction, you know, here's my cow and, you know, and the here, now we're going to get married, you know, trade the cow for like a bride kind of thing. Um, you know, where it's based on family, one family, like an agreement, um, sharing farms and everything like that. Um, but now it's like, <clears throat> um, you know, there's like polyamory and there's all kinds of sexualities, bisexual, pansexual, you know, there's like non-monogamous, there's open marriages. It's like, it's like, it's just so much variety and complexity. And um, so then now there's more need than ever to enter relationships with mindfulness. Um, so that's why I want to kind of, um, and last point, um, 
you know, now that relationships aren't so much based on an economic foundation, um, and now that people aren't getting married as much or having children as much, we're now being called to ask, so what is the purpose that relationships can serve us? And so the purpose is that um, with a less emphasis now on, 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 on money and children and things like that, I feel like relationships are now serving a higher purpose of how can they serve our evolution? How can we grow together? How can we share a vision together and, 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 and work towards it? Right. And that's where I think spirituality is key because spirituality has always been about that. It's always been about having a higher vision, serving the higher self and, you know, higher ideals. So um, that's what I want to bring to relationships. Thank you so much, Samir. Thanks. Jennifer? Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. My name is Jennifer Polanski, and I support women in their journey home to themselves. Uh, I create safe, sacred spaces, retreats. I have an online program, one on one coaching creating a safe space where they can feel supported um, in coming to know who they truly are and getting more into alignment with what their purpose is, why they've come here. Um, and sisterhood, women gathering, uh, creating those connections is a huge part of the work that I do, bringing women together to share, uh, share in sacred space, to see that we are not alone, um, that we are in this together and that we don't have to do this alone and that we're not supposed to, that we are meant to be held. Uh, and this is a, a huge part of what has supported me in terms of relationships um, and why I wanted to, why I was, interested to be on this panel is that so much of our outer world is a reflection of our inner world. So if we're having issues in our relationships, any kind of relationship, it's most often pointing towards something within us that is out of alignment, a lesson that we need to learn by being in this Partnership, just like Sumit said, what is the purpose that relationships are serving? They're serving as mirrors for us. And so uh, in terms of training, I, I am I'm a coach. I am a certified nutritional practitioner, a Reiki teacher. I'm also um, trained in shamanic earth practice and tantric embodiment. Um, and somatic sexual education. So it's using lots of different uh, science with spirituality and earth-based practices to come home, uh, to find the truth, and to live with as much love and pleasure and joy as possible. I'll say that much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So to um, get started, uh, we could just dive into the challenges. What are you guys noticing in your practices as the key challenges that are coming up in loving relationships? For the sake of time, um, maybe today we could focus on intimate relationships, uh, knowing, of course, that those skills um, will transcend to other, other relationships with loved ones, family members, friends. Um, but just for the sake of time, uh, maybe focusing on intimate relationships. So what, what challenges are you noticing in your work <clears throat> in terms of relationships? Um, okay, so for me, what I'm noticing is uh, a lot of perfectionism, um, which uh, it comes quite a bit from our culture, um, partly from technology where um, social media kind of encourages people to create these curated um, images of themselves. Um, and so, what and so we're like we, we have these superficial cultures like um and tinder is something that encourages that i'm not saying like i'm not saying people can't find fulfilling relationships on tinder but it's very much based on the premise of you know we're just going by each other's photos right um not so much who a person is um so <clears throat> and bringing that to the personal level 
the perfectionism that has shown up in my relationships is um so i would i would i would attract these women who um they seem like they have they're they seem like they're very independent strong you know um might even seem like they're one of the guys but then after a while um like more and more issues would keep coming up where there's emotional abuse and things like that happening um so it was almost like I was falling for this illusion and my responsibility in that was that um so with them they were trying to show this perfect image of like look at me like things are all beautiful all pretty and not revealing their ugliness um whereas for me so my issue with that was that um whenever the emotional abuse would occur um just like with a lot of men i'm noticing now especially in my practice there would be this shutting down where um i would be hurt you know deeply hurt but i wouldn't say anything right it's almost like um i was disassociated it's kind of like it it really felt like that like i just blanked out and didn't know what to do because i was so shocked because i had so much bought into the illusion of perfection um so i was so caught off guard when this eventual this ugliness eventually um arose you know so that's the way i i tried to look perfect is that um because if i get upset if i'm angry if i yell then you know um it's kind of like i took the then then that means the relationship's not perfect something's wrong with it um so it's almost like let's brush it under the rug let's not let's pretend like this is an issue um yeah so i feel like um maybe perfectionism shows up for it can show up for men and women differently in relationships not that there can't be overlap for sure um but that is that's something i'm noticing that technology is is feeding a lot of that as well um and especially with now with millennials another thing is that what feeds up perfectionism is that we have very little experience with dealing with tension because of the way we were raised um with conflict resolution um because it's something that was discouraged we were very sheltered growing up not to generalize of course but there's something that i've noticed that's happening a lot um you know like i said i was kept indoors a lot so i didn't know how to interact with people i didn't know how to deal with tension when it comes up so that i wasn't resilient um whereas people who are older from older generations are constantly around people you know they weren't indoors all the time like we were on our computers on our phones you know they were constantly around people so they they had more experience with navigating relationships so um yeah so i feel like those are the two things that are feeding the perfectionism in our culture so that's technology and also the way that we're raising children now interesting yeah yeah maybe i'll pick up on the thread if that's okay melanie i think um samit raised some really interesting points and uh i think we're all kind of weaving together a, a very common story the, the things that i find um people individuals and couples come to me with uh usually start off with just what people expect their intimate partner relationships to be like so you know we often have conversations about what was the script that we were all handed the cultural script and the cultural expectations that were handed to us around what a relationship should be and often our disappointment is really about the gap between our hopes and expectations and our lived experience and we are drawn to partners um, for various reasons. You know, we are mammals, um, like peacocks and other animals. You know, we strut our stuff. We kind of show our prettiest feathers uh, to draw and to attract a partner. Um, but that's short-lived. That's the initial kind of phase of a relationship and the attraction. But over time then a different part starts to settle in. And I do find that with the couples that I work with is sometimes they find that parts of themselves that they didn't even know are being revealed and expressed in the relationship. And we try to be self-aware, we try to be reflective, but that's, that's a lot, you know, and it's very much something that weaves and evolves over time. So the person I was when I was 20 is still the same person I am now at 54. Um, but I am different. I am still the core essence of who I am, but I, I am different as well. So as relationships go through time, 
those individuals also change and develop. And then people look at one another if they've been on autopilot for a while, because I think we all kind of just for survival day to day go on an autopilot, but a relationship can go into autopilot, particularly if you have very busy lives and if you have children in your relationship, uh, you know, it's, it's busy from morning till bedtime and then you just flop and, you know, watch the news and go to bed, right? So there's a real um, tendency to go on to autopilot at different stages in life. And often I find with, with couples that I work with that things sort of get disrupted when there's a transition in their life or a change. So children transitioning from, you know, preschool into school or particularly as children are launching out of the family home uh, into independence uh, or just an un seen life change, job loss, global pandemic, <laughs> uh, all kinds of things can trigger people to stop being on autopilot and now they have to actually drive the relationship and take a little bit more ownership in noticing are they off course and how do they steer back and, and where does that go. Uh, so that's some of, of kind of what I go with, uh, with people, but also um, we all have attachment styles. So this is kind of drawing on some of the kind of popular literature from the, the 1990s um, around attachment theory. And, uh, you know, that we have different styles of attachment and different drives for intimacy. And some people are moving toward very close intimacy. And then some partners are really triggered by that in a way that they pull back. Uh, so understanding what your style and approach is to intimacy and relationships is really important in being able to understand yourself and your partner uh, about how you might be unintentionally or unaware of how you're triggering one another. And then I think back to what I said about the script that we're all handed is, is what do you do when you don't fit that script? What do you do when your sexual orientation is not 100% heterosexual? Because that's the script that's handed to us. What if you see yourself as having different partners over your lifetime? That's again, not the script that we're handed. There's often when people are separating, it's viewed as a failure and somebody's blamed. Uh, so I think it's really difficult for us to reconcile who we are, our own desires and our own path with those cultural social expectations, particularly when there are children involved and if partners are needing to renegotiate their relationship and at the same time be good, healthy, whole, strong parents. So I'll stop there. <laughs> but that's sort of the themes that I see with people. Um, and maybe we can talk a little bit more later about some of the, the you know, COVID pandemic triggers that have come for people, but that's sort of in general. Thank you very much, Miranda. Thank you. Jennifer, how about you? What are you noticing in terms of challenges right now? Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you both for everything that you shared. Really, really good stuff. Uh, Miranda, I love what you said about the, the script that we're handed. Uh, and, and to me, what you shared about this, this perfectionism. Um, I think there's, there's, I see so much of this need to look good. Uh, there is a very deep need as humans to be accepted, to be loved to be accepted into the group. And so we are handed this script of, here's what you need to do in order to be accepted, but that doesn't always fit. And so there's this constant need to look good. And what I find with people is that a lot of the arguments happen from a need to be right. And so rather than listening to each other and actually, because really it's so many of the arguments come out of our wounding and we just want to be acknowledged. We just want to be seen for what we're going through. But when we're in a relationship where both people are just wanting to be right and not look bad, then there's, there's no listening when it comes to, well, why, what's, what's at the root? What's at the core of what this person is sharing? Um, 
And so this idea of not being heard and taking the time to actually listen to the other person and rather than defend ourselves, being able to listen. And so this thing about triggers, I find that in relationships, people will either, or sorry, about wounds, people will either trigger the other's wounds or they'll pacify each other's wounds. And that's where autopilot can start to kick in is that everything is under the surface and we just kind of skim the surface. We don't really dive deep. Or there are people who dive deep and are constantly in arguments, kicking up each other's stuff. And, and that's where you can do some really good work because I believe it's so deeply rooted in, in childhood, the way that we grew up and our wounding. And it's often our inner children that are fighting with each other rather than our adult selves. So when couples can start to think in that way, that when there's an argument, that wait a second, this isn't necessarily about this particular thing that's happened, but it, it reflects something much deeper. And when there's a curiosity to actually go deeper, then that's when relationships can really grow and thrive. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's all I'd like to say about that for now. Thank you. Thank you. Such a rich topic. Um, you know, my next question, it was the, the curated question was largely around um, asking for each of your advice about some of the top skills that are needed for, for moving through some of the challenges that are coming up. But I'd actually like to shift gears and move right into some of the questions that are, co that are coming from our guests. Um, some of these questions came in from people who are not with us today. They, they couldn't make it, but they sent their questions and they're looking forward to the recording afterwards. Um, so one, uh, and, and through these, I'm thinking you guys could, um, could dive into the skills that do come up that are needed to deal with these specific issues. And if there's anything left remaining uh, at the end, we can, we can hone on that. But um, I do think a lot of great skills will come up that are very relevant for our guests, um, you know, from each of you, and it will give us a little bit more time to, to focus on what's relevant for, for, for folks. Um, and if you do have a question, guys, you can send it to me privately in the chat box, um, or you can send it to everybody if you're comfortable with your question being seen. So my, my first question is, um, is from Anonymous. Um, my partner and I have totally different views regarding COVID. I've seen this come up in a bunch of relationships as well, like friendships, family members. Um, we have different feelings about COVID in terms of social distancing and all the protocols. And it's really stressing our relationship because one of us feels like the other isn't behaving safely while the, while the other person believes that the other person is overreacting. Um, do you have any suggestions to help us respect our differences without minimizing each other's feelings or needs? Who would like to dive into that one? <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to go into that. Um, whether, whether it's about COVID or it's about some seemingly benign thing, um, what I believe it comes down to is what we do in order to feel safe. And so rather than look at, well, you don't need to be worried because look at all these numbers, look at all these facts. That's not the point. The point is this person who you've committed to, to loving and to being with doesn't feel safe. And so asking the questions of, well, what about this doesn't make you feel safe? Or it's, it's finding the deeper root rather than arguing about the surface issue. And I find that especially with COVID, it's, it's being a catalyst. Um, this, is, this is a representation of something much deeper. Um, and so it's inviting us 
to go deeper. And if we stay at the surface, then something else is just going to come along to force us to go deeper. I mean, this was a pretty big thing. Um, I won't go into it too much, but certainly when it first in those first couple months, my thoughts were, well, we weren't listening, were we? And now this had to happen to really get us to, to pay attention to how we're living. That's how I saw it. Um, and so specifically with, with this situation, I think it would be really beautiful for couples to sit across from each other. And if a mediator is needed, then, you know, a neutral friend or, or someone who's a professional to, to sit across from each other and share, this is how I feel. This is how I feel. And then the other person repeats back, what I heard you say is, and this is how I feel. And that way, both people are are being heard and feeling heard. And very often that begins to break apart the, the tension and the, uh, the stalemate that's happening. I'll put that there. Thank you. Uh, great, great points, Jennifer. It's um, the stalemate's really tough for people to break out of, right? I think often uh, couples will kind of dig into their positions and get really stuck there. Uh, what I've noticed with um, the pandemic and, and how people have been responding to that as, as couples, couples who live together, is, um, is it kind of brings about that whole dynamic of am I an individual or am I part of this couple partnership or this family system? And I think it sort of starts to uh, shine a light on some of those tensions that many people feel. Um, and some people, some families, some couples, they don't really feel the tension. They have a very strong sense of a cohesive partnership and use pronouns of we and us and negotiate and are very agreeable on lots of things that affect the, the, their, their system, their, their grouping, their coupling. Uh, so for, for some of the um, people that I've seen during the pandemic, um, they've actually been quite united in that. And there's less of a sense of I and me and much more of a strong sense of us and we. And I think that in couple relationships, that's often the, the tension is me as an individual and how I am and then us as a couple, as a people in a relationship. And for where there's conflict uh, and I think COVID has really uh, for many people uh, focused on all of the places globally where we uh, have vulnerabilities whether it's in our public health system you know our, our uh, long-term care facilities homeless shelters but also in ourselves so a lot of people who tend to be a little more worrisome or anxious many people uh, have been quite triggered by the pandemic to be more anxious and more cautious. Um, and if the other partner is not inclined that way, I think that's where I've seen some tension and conflict where there's some pre-existing um, anxiousness. And then we get into that struggle of I, me, and us and we, and then this other layer of, of worry that's both real and maybe more anxiety based. So it's complicated. It really does require um, really great communication skills. Uh, and when I say communication, I mean much more on the listening and understanding side of communication rather than speaking. And uh, most couples I work with, we spend a lot of time on the skill of listening. When people listen and listen deeply, then they can more um, have more empathy and understand where their partner uh, is experiencing and where they're coming from. Yeah, uh, great points from both of you. Um, I think something that can help a lot is just knowing that um, even the experts are not really sure what's going on. You know, some of the time um, they they flip flopped on you know some policies sometimes they say mass sometimes they don't say mass some doctors say they don't work some say they work so it's like 
okay, kind of just know that, that com have that humility of, okay, we kind of, it's very complicated. We all kind of don't know really what to do. It's called novel for a reason. It's new. Um, so we're all just kind of figuring it out together. <clears throat> um, so something that could help is just, you know, to just learn together, you know, um, do some research together openly with, without judgment. Um, I definitely agree with what Jennifer was saying about look at the deeper issue. You know, is this about, because if the, if the relationship is so strong and powerful, you know, um, I get that there's an issue of safety, but should someone really wearing a mask, whatever, really, um, really undermine it for you. Right. So is it about control? Is it about, um, your, um, your ego, like, oh, how can I be with someone who would be wearing a mask or someone who wouldn't be wearing a mask, you know? Um, so is it about that? Because sometimes it is, right? I know that's what it was for me. Because um, there's a lot of different, um, in my in my relationship, there's very polarized political opinions that can arise. But what has helped is that, because, you know, at first there would be some, uh, sometimes we both would kind of mock each other and sometimes there would be disrespect. But then when we actually took the time to just like, okay, hold on. Okay, I just, I just wanted to explain why you believe this, you know, and then, so we both give examples, we bring up articles, and and then by the end of it, we're like, yeah, this is really complicated, you know, um, and we all, and we, we kind of come out of it with the synthesis of both of our views, it's like, kind of, we're both right and wrong, we're both, it's kind of like, we, um, there's a balance. So I, I see the value in the other person's perspective, because now they bring balance to mine, because mine was a bit extreme. And so that's where this is useful. So that's where you can find that this polarity can be useful because like, okay, do I need to bring some balance? Um, you know, because if I'm thinking no mask ever, is that a bit extreme or in some situations are they warranted? You know, so it's like bring some open-mindedness. And one last thing is that um, in my relationship, we've, we've gifted each other what we call these, uh, a love book. So it's all the reasons that we kind of, we fell in love with each other. And so in the book, you know, at the end of the book, it says to, to whenever we're angry at each other, upset, whatever it is that, uh, to remind ourselves to look through the love book, you know, um, for all the reasons that we love, uh, that we fell in love with each other, because, because when I, when I look, when I look through it, it's like, I, I remember all the memories and, and, and the connection and the compatibility and just how much happiness that brings me, how much it's changed me as a person. I'm like, and then I see how petty this this argument is. It's like it's not it's not really worth it, especially when we live in such precarious times when, you know, a lot of people are dying from like accidents, from viruses, from so many different things, famine. It's like, is it really worth it when our time is becoming increasingly limited, increasingly uncertain, to be spending so much time in disagreement, you know, in conflict, when there's so much that br brings us together, right? So have an anchor, you know have something that you can re remind yourself of why you've be entered this union to begin with, you know, um, because the more you, you use it as a resource, the more all this kind of tension and stuff just seems petty, you know, it will dissolve. Um, because that's sometimes that's all we need is just like meditation, right? It's just coming off center. Um, you know, it's like whenever, you know, you become upset at someone, uh, someone says, and, um you forget it's it's the monkey mind you forget about the context you forget to have empathy you know did, did this person not get any sleep you know is there a loved one dying in the hospital and have they been grieving right but if we're reacting which our culture always encourages react 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 here's a tweet to react to it don't think about it don't question it don't do your own research like okay then we're not gonna have the patience to be like hey are you okay um instead of always making making about our pain our ego right Mm -hmm. So come back to some, help ha, have something that helps you come back to center is what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. I hear a lot of similar themes in terms of your guys' responses to that question that um, I think could help a lot of folks in different um, challenges in relationships when you're both coming from really seemingly very different perspectives or different points of view to, um, you know, do the act of listening and the mirroring, um, you know, when you, when you repeat back to the person, what you've heard them yeah. say, seeking mediation um grounded i like what what sumit said about the mindfulness part i like what sumit said about mindfulness because i think you know 
often in a conversation that escalates and gets heated is um, is it feels there's a, a desperation for each person to make their point and to be heard. <laughs> so then sometimes the po points get made more poignantly and more passionately, which shuts down the, the communication and the connection. Um, but a practice of mindfulness, I think, is, is one piece, is it, it helps you to step out of the intense emotion and to observe it. Yeah. Um, and it's also, and this is one of the things I've been reading more about, is about um, the philosophy of the ancient Stoics, is um, having what they refer to as the view from above, which is really about perspective taking. Uh, so not just you know, sort of looking at your own emotions in a mindful way and watching that, but also taking more steps back and looking at the bigger picture. Because when we're heated in the conversation in the, in the moment, we are triggered emotionally and say things that are from those intense emotions. But uh, a stoic practice or a mindfulness practice is about noticing those emotions but being able to see a, a much bigger picture and perspective, much what Samit was saying, you know, going to what he and his partner have created as a, a love book, a love story about who are we? And that, that helps to take, uh, you know, him into that perspective, mm -hmm. which is so helpful. And that's often what we lose in times of conflict is perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to um, dive into- yeah, Can a I say- Oh, yeah. I just want to highlight that last thing that Miranda had said earlier, uh, and it, it all ties so beautifully together with what's being shared and the practices that are being offered, is, is when you spoke about when we hear each other, it's so, much more, it's so much easier to be compassionate. And so I really want to highlight that, that when we are able to really hear the other person and to, be, to have, a, have a few minutes meditation and to bring more mindfulness to it, it really supports in, in cultivating compassion for the other. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Carol had asked earlier um, a question. It's, it's, it's about moving beyond forgiveness. Like there might've been hurt that had, that had happened both ways. Um, it's about letting go. Like, do you guys have any suggestions or recommendations, tools, practices, for when you really need to just let go of the baggage, release um, that that so you're not you're not hashing it up and and thinking about something that's in the past. It's not it's you're you're letting go of those cords. Um, I'm summarizing, Carol. Um, so do you does that does that um, capture your your question, Carol? Yeah. Do you guys have any suggestions for when it's time? I don't I don't want to get into forgiveness. I need to let this go. What would you suggest? Hmm. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> something that's helpful I, I find in letting go is always um, is always about the lesson. You know, um, what purpose did this relationship fulfill this person in my life? Um, because I, I I notice that every time that I learn the lesson, I every time I learn the why, right? Um, that that thing or person just they faded away you know um you know it's like uh, uh rumi's poem the guest house where um he talks about how people in our lives they it's like our life is a guest house and people come and they go you know for varying lengths of time and they all come bearing gifts right which is which are which are lessons for our soul to evolve right to grow um so Re reflection is what I'm saying is that um, is, is, is always helped me let go um, by kind of looking at the relationship what went wrong just asking myself various questions why did it go wrong when you know where um, what could have gone better and how can I use this to be to uh, move forward in life to make my dreams come true what did this person teach me about myself because once I've learned the lessons I instead of having this kind of not being able to let go of it there's this gratitude it's like wow i instead of feeling hurt and broken over the, the devastating losses there's more just awe and gratitude it's like wow i can't believe the universe sent me something so beautiful so that i can heal and grow and learn and become a more whole and self-actualized person so it's a lot of that it's it's a lot of spend some time alone um preferably outdoors um 
you know, where it's quiet, where there's nature, you know, maybe by a river and just, and just reflect on it and meditate, ask yourself questions about it, have a dialogue with yourself, journal about it. And another thing that, it, that helps me move on is empathy, you know, um, where our relationships ended and, and like you said, I'm, there's having trouble letting go of what the other person has done, how I have behaved myself as well. But then when I, when I look at um, the person's story and my story, you know, of how we got to that point, um, there's just all this empathy and it's like, it makes sense to me because I can see what led up to this moment. So there's, um, so then there's not that confusion of, oh, how did things get like this? And how do we treat each other like this, even though we first loved each other? Because you can see now how, like Jennifer was saying, you know, you can see how our behavior was arising from the wounding. You know, can you ex can you acknowledge the woundedness in the other person because they were just mirroring to your own woundedness? Mm -hmm. So um, I find that of the of the time, and I'd like to hear from Jennifer and Miranda as well. And we still have another two questions. Nice. Okay. Um, I just wanted sure. to uh, like a, like a heads up uh, just to finish your thought and then I'd love to hear from um, Miranda and Jennifer as well. Yeah, so the last thought is just um, when I have trouble forgiving myself is when what helps is just looking at my story and, and, and seeing what I've gone through, just feeling um, grieving that, you know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Uh, I Maybe I, I'll try I, some of the points that Sumit said I was uh, also on my mind, but I, I think um, where letting go is really difficult for people is usually when there's a betrayal of trust. That's the hardest wound for people to really heal from. And, uh, you know, we are sort of speaking in general terms because it's a you know recorded session um, online. But I think when there's betrayal of trust, that is the hardest for us to, to heal from. Um, that sense of safety uh, has really bottomed out for us. Uh, I, I guess two things I would say is one is I encourage people to really feel uh, emotionally the depth of that betrayal. Because if you start to feel it and then shut it off, you're gonna feel it again tomorrow. So some of the, what keeps us in that uh, memory and experience is that we end up prolonging the experience over many years and then experiencing it over and over again in our minds and in our hearts. Um, but allowing ourselves to really feel the depth of that betrayal and to, you know, just have like that gut wrenching cry or scream or whatever the emotion is, but to really be raw with it. Uh, that's very cleansing and healing. And I think a lot of us are really reluctant to do that. We get close to that and then we pull back from the pain. And the other is where I draw on, um, on you know, Buddhist philosophy and, and, and my yoga philosophy that I have, you know, learned uh, and studied is that a lot of our suffering or all of our suffering is two things. It's our memories of the past where we continue to relive and replay uh, past experiences or worries and fantasies about the future uh, and our attachments to both the past and to the imagined future and that therein lies the bulk of our suffering. Uh, you can't force anyone to just let it go, you know, um, but I think doing that real raw experiencing the emotion and then having the awareness that the emotion is past reliving or looking forward at hopes and things that we're attached to that are fantasies. Beautiful. Yeah, great. Going off of what, what Miranda just, just shared about feeling the depth of it, absolutely. Because we say, and I say it too, we talk about letting go, I'm gonna let this go. And really what that means is I'm gonna push this away. I have felt this as much as I feel I was supposed to feel it, now it's time to move on. And what it does is it creates a resistance and whatever we push against is going to push back. And so absolutely going into, wow, this is, this is real, this is something I'm still carrying. Wow, I'm really feeling this. Be curious, bring a curiosity as much as you can to, hmm, interesting. 
and loving yourself there. I allow myself to still be holding on to this. It is totally okay that this is still in my field and that I'm having a hard time letting this go. And as much as you can, love the heck out of yourself for everything that you're feeling. And by going so deep into it, it starts to dissolve the resistance to it. And again, it breaks apart the energy. It starts to dissipate. Now, there's also an aspect of, of energy here. So one of the main things that I work with, um, I certainly am comfortable going until 12.05. One of the big things I work with is energy medicine. We can have physical hooks in our body and matter is, is simply dense energy. That's what it is. And so we can also have energetic hooks. So if you're finding you're feeling this energy when we're in a, in a relationship of any kind where um, the other person can be quite smothering. It's an energetic thing. They're not actually physically smothering us, but energetically we feel confined. And so if you're feeling that there's still a hook in there, then chances are energetically there is. And so either yourself getting some, some sage, palo santo, clearing herbs, and speaking some proclamations, I am ready to learn the lessons that I was supposed to learn from this and move, move on in my life. Or um, I'm happy to have a conversation with you about how to go even deeper into that if that's not something that um, you do regularly. But I think for everyone, clearing and cleansing your energy field, it's something that I speak in my morning practice every single day as a clearing command because we pick stuff up. Um, one last thing is that so often it's the wound that the memory triggered rather than that thing that happened. It's what, what core wound did that trigger for you? And so asking the question, how did that make me feel? And then how did it make me feel? Okay. That's the, that's the thing to, uh, to learn that, that I still need to learn. Wow, such a wealth of, um, of information and knowledge. Um, Carol, you know, um, I just wanted to add one of, um, in terms of energetic clearing, um, I've never been one to cut cords, like a severance of a cord, um, but I, I blast them with love. So once, once the awareness of um, the lesson has emerged and the medicine that is in that relationship shows up like this is what it was here to teach me this is how it's helped me evolve as a human being this is that deeper perspective that i have and you recognize there might be an energetic cord or attachment or hook like jennifer was talking i visualize that cord and um kind of like a care bear stare uh blast that cord with with pure compassion and love like thank you gratitude for everything that this this was everything that this taught me and it until the cord dissolves and you just like it just turns to dust and smoke and just in your mind's eye like allow it to allow it to fully dissolve and it i find um the cords are are much less likely to grow back with that with that practice um yeah so it's helped me and my clients in the past um so we have another question. I had just wanted to ask guys, uh, because we're at 12, if you guys are also, uh, thank you, Jen, and unhooking the cord rather than cutting because cutting um, one end stays with you. And I found that whenever you do cord cutting, it doesn't energetically, it doesn't, it's not really the best strategy, I don't think. Um, and it leaves a wound, like it's like it doesn't, you know, it's not, um, and I don't think it's something to play around with if you haven't, you know, had any experience energetically cutting cords. Um, but dissolving is, um, it's powerful and it's gentle and it moves the energy really nicely. Um, so yes, I wanted to touch base to see if you guys are, are cool with staying on for five more minutes. Um, Anne, Carol, Bianti, um, you're an S. 
Um, are you okay with staying on? Okay, cool. So um, one person had asked, um, you know, they were just kind of, kind of on the release topic, actually. They're in a toxic relationship, um, but how do you know that you're in a toxic relationship? And how do you know when you need to, if, it, if it's worth fixing? or if you got to, if, if it's time to get out um, in this person's quote unquote, run in the other direction. Like, when do you, when do you know that it's toxic? What are the hallmark signs? And if you do have a toxic relationship, how do you decipher about whether you can really work on it and then, <clears throat> then you got to go? Yeah. Uh, excellent question. Um, I've been in some toxic relationships, so I definitely have been able to identify signs. Um, some of which include uh, when the person's um, action, uh, their words don't align with their actions. That's a huge red flag um, that they're dishonest person. So, you know, um, it's like what I mentioned earlier about the illusions that I fell for. So, you know, so, so someone would say that they're curious and a lifelong learner and they're very skeptical. And wow, that's very attractive to me because I love those qualities. But then what I would notice is that Okay, this person isn't really educating themselves on an ongoing basis. They're kind of indulging in a lot of bad habits and they're not really questioning things a lot. They're not asking, they're not curious about my life and things like that. So I was like, mm, okay, that's, so why did you say that you are all those things, but now you're not? So a good way to, a good way to assess someone's honesty is just to, you know, question them. You know, okay, so you say you're curious. So like, where has that shown up in your life? How are you curious? You know, what are, how do you continue? How do you educate yourself? Things like that. Um, yeah, so that's that's one. Um, another one would be just like um, if you have to walk on eggshells around them. Um, if a person gaslights you, which means that uh, is that's gaslighting is when uh, someone makes you doubt yourself. Uh, so an example of that would be it's like one of Max's would kept saying, "Oh, I don't, I don't want you to cheat on me. I don't want you to cheat on me." It's like it's like, I don't get why she keeps saying that. Cause it's like, it was only my first relationship ever. And so what I eventually came down to was she kept making it about me, but it was really about her promising too much. Right. And she wasn't taking ownership of that. So it's like, so that's where, where something doesn't feel, I guess the word is incongruent. Where it's like, okay, person, uh, where's this coming from? Right. And, um, and, and if you're in this mode of like, um, being a victim, blaming yourself, um, then it's hard to, it would be hard to identify that. So, um, and so one more thing. Okay. So those are just some signs, but how do you know when to walk away? Um, that would be, <clears throat> so a, this is a big lesson for me is, and this is something you can take away for any person in your life. If a person is not doing anything to change, they will not change. Right. So something I had to learn is, you know, I would bring up issues with people and they would keep apologizing but then they would keep doing the same things. So, and what I've read is that actually uh, apologies without change behavior is just manipulation, right? Because then you get hooked into this drug of, you know, this hopium that things will eventually be different. So look at, okay, so you say you're going to change, but um, you know, are you going to therapy? Are you meditating? Are you going, are you exercising? Like what are you journaling, reflecting? Like, what is it? Are, what is it that you're doing to change? You know? Cause it's not as easy as just saying it. You have to have a plan. You have to have a strategy. And one more thing. Um, if a person can't explain to you um, why they behave the way they do, um, that's usually a good sign that, you know, they're lacking self-awareness and an issue will be persistent until someone is able to understand why they're like that. So if they can't, if they can't explain the root cause of their behavior, then that's a good sign that the issue will be persistent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Miranda or Jennifer, um, would either of you be able to, to touch Sure. On? I'll just add a few comments. Um, you know, I, I think uh, relationships are much like, uh, as I use the metaphor often of, of going into a store, you know, you're walking down the street, you see what's in the storefront. You say, oh, I like that. So that draws you to go into the store, right? So you're getting the metaphor, right? And then you walk around the store, you see some stuff that, oh, I, I, this is like a really cool store. I love this store. Um, and, and that's how a new person is to us. There's something about them that draws us in and, and stores put their best things in the storefront and then they position their merchandise in the store in order to get that 
point of sale, closing the sale, right? So, but you know, what's behind the counter of the store? What's in the storage room? And that really doesn't get revealed until you are in the relationship, sometimes for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And then what's behind that kind of door in the corner that leads to the basement, right? So, I mean, you're kind of getting the metaphor, right? And, and I don't think that a lot of people really know themselves well enough to know what's lurking in their own basements, right? So, so some of this is that people's awareness may or may not be there as they come into a relationship. We've put all of our energy into the storefront and what's in our store. Um, but once you're in the relationship, then those other things are revealed. And the whole thing around being toxic, I mean, I, I think, you know, there's so much on the internet around emotional abuse and, you know, physical violence, sexual violence. If there is any of those more, what I would call toxic dynamics, I don't think in my experience that most people who are so-called toxic really have the transformational change that is needed to no longer be that way. Uh, the, the capacity to really change uh, is, is, uh, is quite limited. So I think the tweaking around the edges of a relationship can be helpful, but that kind of fundamental profound change of who you are um, pretty rare that somebody actually really fundamentally changes that. Hope that helps. Mm, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll second that idea of, um, are they, are they willing to grow? And I don't think that, um, you know, it's, it's a checklist that, okay, now it's time to run. It's, it's quite individual. I think it's very important to be in, in conversations with others who you feel safe. Um, sometimes we can share what's coming up in relationship and people can make judgments. And so being very mindful of who we're opening up to about it, we wanna to speak to people who can have a neutral eye and ask questions rather than make judgments about our relationship because sometimes you're just going through a hard time but if there's really um, a fundamental issue that one or both parties are not willing to look at then then no it, it it can't work and also asking yourself how do i feel when i'm with this person how do you know if you're in a toxic relationship well how do you feel with them do you feel really good and like you're being encouraged to be your best self? Um, do you feel supported? Do you feel safe? And if you don't, then that's the conversation to have. And if the other can't have that conversation without being defensive or getting aggressive, then in, in my um, opinion, without looking at the individual relationship, because everyone is unique, I would say that's pointing toward a toxic relationship. The words toxic and abusive and all of these terms are kind of a little ambiguous and we may not get time to get into it. Um, people can stay in abusive, harmful relationships for years and 20, 30 years later wish that they had left. And I will say, if you are in an abusive relationship, have some really good conversations with people in your life who are going to tell you something other than what you want to hear which is that there's hope and stay. Uh, I know it's painful, um, but I would strongly suggest you talk to somebody who knows about abusive relationships and um, can help you to really understand what's going on. I have seen so many people in abusive relationships for 30, 40 years and look back and regret not making that decision sooner. Uh, so we have to talk to people, we have to give hope and chance for change, um, but we also have to take care of ourselves and not look back that 30 years was given to a hope that wasn't really there. And to me, that's a hopeful message. <laughs> so Yeah, yeah I've, I've also known a bunch of people that have stayed in um, what they might say as toxic. Uh, when they're really actually quite abusive because um, they're seeing the best in that other person, but not really 
not really recognizing the relationship is quite um, quite abusive and harmful. We do live in a culture that really values redemption, mm -hmm. uh, whether it comes from religious experience and that kind of transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do think there's some really lovely um, values in sticking with people and loving them unconditionally. Um, but abusive relationships are harmful and uh, it leads to years of, of emotional and spiritual and physical harm and they are dangerous. Mm. Yeah, yeah, very good point. So um, we do, we, we had one more question um, from Letitia that I just wanted to, uh, to our viewers who will be watching the recording to know that um, we will continue with this last question and then we will leave. But to our participants here now, I really wanna respect your time. And if you need to um, head out, I, I totally re respect and appreciate that and look forward to continuing these conversations with you, you know, moving forward. Um, uh, this, this last one, I just can't imagine not asking it. It just seems really important. So even if, even if we only touched on it uh, a minute each. Um, my partner has experienced a lot of trauma in their childhood and it affects our relationship in so many ways. Sometimes I feel over my head, but we really do care for each other. They are in therapy. But I am wondering if I need therapy and, or even some skills to um, some training or something. How do I be in a healthy, supportive, how do I be a healthy, supportive partner without being their counselor? I know this is a huge question. Um, it's just such a, I, in, in, my, in my experience as well, I just see it happening a lot, especially when people are in a relationship problem, that there's this um, dynamic that happens where the, the person that is, is dealing with the childhood issue or the trauma or the wound is um, their issues are coming up a lot. And the other person is always kind of rescuing or accommodating or, um, and sometimes they just don't have the skills to do it. So I just wanted to uh, make sure that we had a moment to, to touch on this and also to make sure that in the supporting document, we give this person some, some skills and tools and maybe some, some extra resources and support as well. Um, Miranda, did you want to get started? Sure, just really briefly. I think it's an excellent question. Um, I always have, um, whether it's an individual I'm seeing or a couple, uh, and then I see the individual with the, the trauma recovery, is um, just some, you know, start with the basic reading materials, learn about trauma, understand, um, you know, how it operates, what it does to, um, to individuals over time, how it impacts intimacy uh, and and then very gently encouraging communication between people so often if I'm seeing somebody individually who's in a trauma recovery um, about every five or six sessions we may set aside time for them and their partner to come in together um, to have a conversation about where the person's at in their healing and what's helpful in the relationship and what's not helpful so it's a, you know, something that I do offer to people is to have some couple sessions, um, but also for the, you know, supporting partner to become very educated. And for the two of them, as best as possible to very patiently and compassionately communicate and check in with each other much more frequently than most couples would. Because that, that healing and recovery work is is very raw and very intense and more frequent checking in with one another uh, is really helpful for both parties. Mm, thank you, well said. Um, two, two things really, my first, first, first and foremost, I really honor, uh, I really honor this question and the, the being who posed it and thank you. Thank you for your compassion and your desire to support your partner. Um, my first, one of my first questions is um, to, to ask hmm, this tendency to help and support others at the expense of ourselves. 
and it can be uh, dubbed like a, a savior complex, which sometimes we can get into with partners. And so my first um, point or invitation is to really support yourself. Make sure that you feel grounded and supported um, in, in your life, in your being, uh, so that when you move to support this partner that you love and that you want to help, you're coming from a place of feeling quite grounded yourself. And then I think that having some basic training around trauma is an excellent thing. I think that everyone could use this. And so definitely if, if we can share some resources in the supporting documents, um, I think very important to, to have that, that training so that you can show up in a more supportive way. And just what Miranda was saying, checking in with each other more often than, than many couples would. Um, because it may be, not to oversimplify, but it, it could be some small questions and practices that will support the movement of this trauma and the healing of this trauma and to heal together what a, what a beautiful thing. Mm. So that's a yes to getting support yourself. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Meet, do you have anything to add before we close for today? Yeah, um, so I have experience with being in a relationship with someone who has trauma. Um, so what would I say is, yeah, two things is um, make sure that you're taking very good care of yourself because that's going to affect your resilience. Um, because the more stressed out you are, the more you're going to be um, prone to being triggered by the other person. Um, so yeah, because the more I take care of myself, the more like my energy's up, my resilience, my mood. So that's all going to help. And secondly. Um, a big issue with people who have trauma is that they're, um, uh, they struggle with presence, right? They're, they can be triggered by certain things, disassociated. Um, <clears throat> so what could help is just rituals, you know, introduce something into a relationship that helps both of you bring in some awareness, right? Uh, before you engage in whatever it is, whether it's a conversation or an event, just breathe together, you know, set an intention, have an anchor. What, uh, what would help with someone who has trauma is just, um, is help them find an anchor that they can use to stay grounded in the present moment. Uh, one um, skill for dealing with trauma is and help them come back to the present. It's like, okay, where are you? What's your name? You know, what color is the, is the wall? What time is it? So just help them bring, come back to presence. You know, don't try to rescue or save, but just be the constant reminder of, okay, you're just experiencing some, a feeling it will pass just like all the other feelings. And so just when you're ready, you know, just come back to presence, you know? Mm, thank you. Really great resources and skills. So this um, supporting document is going to be a doozy. <laughs> we have so many things that we've covered. Um, I, I'm really looking forward to pulling that together. Um, I just want to thank you all so much, um, Miranda, Jennifer, and Samit, for all your wisdom and the experience that you've been able to have both through lived experience as well as through your client work and your ability to articulate some very uh, supportive resources to help people navigate uh, relationship challenges right now. Um, you know, tensions are high and there's a lot of transition um, going on in our, in our, our homes, our, our families, our community. Um, right now, definitely. And uh, it's, it's really thrusting an opportunity forward for us to grow and evolve and tend our relationships and, uh, and clear what no longer serves as well. Um, and I, I, it's, that, it's that really beautiful balance between what to tend and what to clear and you know, having that clear, effective communication throughout, the listening. Uh, the groundedness, the presence, the mindfulness, recognizing the lesson in it um, so that you can really take advantage and move through it. So I just really, really appreciate everything that you brought forward. It was really, really powerful conversation. Um, and I, I know we went a little bit longer than usual, but I'm, I'm very grateful also for 
the extension that you've each given in your time to to be present for for these uh, for our guests' questions. Um, I uh, yeah, very grateful. So without further ado, um, just like to thank all of our guests for for being with us today as well. I hope you have a great day. Did anybody want to have any clo closing remarks? I just wanted to uh, to thank everybody, um, the three of you, each and every one of you, so wise, um, very, very special. Definitely a tear was brought to my eye uh, on more than one occasion and very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Rhonda. Thank you. Mm -hmm.